So today I want to talk about hospitality, really. That's the, the real title. If you want a real title, it's hospitality. But that first one I put up there, um, Whom Jesus Loved, because there's this, for a while, ever since actually our trip to DR, the story of Mary and Martha has really, I feel like I'm seeing some different things I didn't see before, and it's a story, especially that family. If you think about it, that family, we, we meet that family three times in the course of the New Testament. To me, that's special for a family to be highlighted three times. And also for this specifically to say, like, in the, the third story we're going to look at, or the second story, um, when Lazarus rose, whom Jesus loved. That means really, Jesus really had an affection toward this family. And if, if these people are highlighted three times, then maybe there's something special we need to look at as well. So I'm going to look at the three times that we meet this family from Bethany and what we can kind of glean off of that and what maybe God wants us to see this morning. But one of the main themes is also, this is a family that was willing to host Jesus, that made space for Jesus, that continually did that. They opened their home three times for him to come. So that's really special. And that's important for us to ask ourselves, are we making sure we're leaving, we're having space for Jesus in our homes, in our families, to make sure he feels very welcome and giving him space for that. So let's look, open up to Luke 10.38. And we're going to look at the first story. And this is a really actually a very short story, but I was always fascinated with from this few, few verses how we get so much from just a few verses. So again, Luke 10, 38. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So let's start at the beginning. And I know this is a story most of us have heard. But first we see he comes into the village. We know that's Bethany. They are from Bethany. And he comes to Martha's house. So that's something significant to say that they came to Martha's house. She was the head of the household. This was her house. It also means that she might have gone through some things. Probably a loss of a husband. She's probably a widow. But she's, she's well off the fact that this is her house. So that says something about her. Then we meet Mary. I find it interesting that we haven't met Lazarus yet, that later on we meet Lazarus. But again, he comes to Martha's home. She's inviting him into her house. Again, making room for Jesus. And then we see Mary. They said that he, she is sitting at Jesus' feet. Then all of a sudden, verse 40 comes. And we're starting to get a little bit more of how Martha's in her life, about how Martha's really doing. Because you think, like, she's serving. The issue is not her serving. And that's what a lot of people want to point out. Like, oh, it's because she's busy serving and doing all that. No, it was an honor to do what she's doing. Serving wasn't the issue. Jesus is about to reveal that it's a lot more than that. Jesus wanted to get right to her soul, the condition of her soul to reveal to her that you're worried about many things. It wasn't the, the busyness. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't the serving that was the issue. It was the condition of her soul, that she was worried about many things. And busyness can be a symptom of wanting to hide things. I just, again, I, I went through this story in DR when we went this summer, and you know, I just, sometimes God will drop things to you to share and we, it was a mixture of young and older women. It was a story that changed several times of who we were really talking to. First we were told young like children, and then it changed to just women, and then it was a mixture of adults and, and young girls. And I you know, tell this story 
of how, and then I got into of how sometimes our busyness can actually be us hiding, can be us actually trying to maybe ignore what's really going on in our heart, in our head. And after that, this older lady just wept. And she said, I needed to hear that because I do exactly that. And to ask herself, sometimes are we so, so into doing this, doing this, doing this, and not being careful of the condition of our heart and our soul? Your serving should never be out of a place of fear or hiding or not making sure you're well. You being well is the most important thing to deal with before you just serve. Because God doesn't have a list that he, oh, you went to church today. Oh, you got to do this and you're doing this. There's no checklist for that. Actually, the top of his list is how are you really doing? How is your soul? How is your heart? That's like the top of his priority. How are you actually doing? And so he goes right in to this one. He says, you are careful and troubled about many things. She's concerned about many things. And here's the invitation to give that concerns to me. Right? He's showing her that your, your sister has chosen the right thing to do at this point. And I think of Mary. Mary positioned herself to fulfill what God has called her to do. And we're going to get to that in the third time that they've met them. But right away, she's recognized that this is the most important person in the room. There's time that we have to recognize that Jesus is the most important person in the room. When worship is happening, that's when we should be positioning ourselves to Jesus. You're the most important person in the room. Nothing else. Nothing else matters at the moment. And there are times I think Jesus, even outside of worship time, Jesus wants to command that attention. It's like, right now, I need you on me. I need you listening to me. And how many times maybe we ignore that with the busyness of life, of making sure we're giving him the attention that he, that he desires. So, and also what's interesting here is that Martha, it was right away she wants to attack her sister. She's like, oh, so it's also we have to ask ourselves, we are not to despise the assignment of others. Maybe there is a season where we're supposed to be resting and listening. There's also a season where we need to be serving and do things like that. And sometimes they could be simultaneous. But just because you're in a season of that doesn't mean you should look at someone else in their season. Wait, wait, why aren't they doing what I'm doing? So we also have to make sure, because it's later on, again, poor Mary gets despised again of what she's about to do. So both times, when she's exactly where she needs to be, she has other people questioning, why, why are you there? Why are you doing that? And I'm sure some of us have, have encountered that in our walk. People might be like, why are you going to church again? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And that's for you to block that out and make sure you're just doing exactly what Jesus has called you to do. That's what your focus needs to be. So again, so fast, just in four verses, right? 38, 39, 40, or oh, more than that. 42, six verses. Okay, I'll do my math today. <laughs> so within six verses, it's a short story. And a lot of, again, a lot of people being like, you know, just it's all about the serving, she's doing that. No, again, it's about the condition of Martha's heart and for Jesus' invitation to come listen to me. Like right now, I'm in your house. You've hosted me. And also, it's interesting, even within her condition, even with her worriness, she made space for Jesus. So even in any, whatever condition you're in, is to choose to make space for Jesus and to allow him to confront that condition. But that's what got me. Like here is Martha. Again, she has that, Jesus is revealed. She has that worry and everything in her. But what does she still choose to do? Invite Jesus into her home, which is exactly what she needed to do, actually. So no matter what our condition is, is to get to make sure we are leaving space, make sure we are hosting Jesus to allow him to transform us. That's what actually kind of hit me last night. Like, whoa. Wait a minute, it's like people want to focus, oh, Mary, Mary, perfect Mary doing, oh, but actually like Martha, like she, that was actually a risk for her to take Jesus into her home at that time. That could have been a huge risk for her socially. That could have been huge. But here she is risking that 
recognizing that she needs this man in her house and then making sure resp she responds the right way, which I think she did because later on we see with Lazarus her faith. So we know that she chose rightly. And again, continuing to give Jesus a space. So let's go on to John 11. And we're going to stay in John because the next one is John 12. But we're going to stay in John. So. And it's the beginning of the chapter there. Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment, and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Store that in the back of your mind, because I find this very interesting. There we have a little foreshadowing, right, of what's coming in the next chapter. So it's interesting that John puts that in there, when technically in his writing, he hasn't even gotten to that yet. But he, he put that in there. Verse 3, Therefore his sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Again, there, you can tell that there's a relationship there. Because right when something's wrong, what are they doing? They're, they're seeking for Jesus. They're, they're trying to get his attention. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, says he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say to him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone you, and you go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbles not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. I always find it fascinating sometimes the disciples' response to Jesus. Right? And, it's, it, and first we want to be like, look at these men, they spend all their living hours, so many days with him, and they sometimes still didn't get it. But how many of us know what we know, and sometimes we still aren't getting it? How patient Jesus is with us. How patient. Because these men, he, he knew that all, that all the times they didn't get it with him physically being there, they would finally get it. Even though it might have taken after his death and resurrection, but they would get it and do what they've been called to do. So just that, that patience Jesus has for, with us, he's probably looking down like, oh, there's Sarah, she messed, like she's doing that thing again, but I know she, eventually she's gonna get it. She's gonna do it, and I know, because I know these are the plans for her. For her. So it's for us to be like, okay, God, what am I continually not getting here? What is it gonna take me for me to get it? And be, to be aware of that. But not to look at them with like, ah. Oh, Look at these men. Be, be like, oh my gosh, God, how patient are you? How patient you are. And then what am I not getting, Jesus? Because if they were able to spend live, like days with you in front of their face and still not get things, God, what, what do I need to do to get, to get what I need to get? But this fear that comes out of them of like, oh, these, they want to get you. And Jesus is like, no, like we're going to walk in the light. A light that's going to be in you to be able to walk where you need to walk and do what we've called to do. He even said, what was the back in verse 4, right? It's going to be something, this is going to be something that glorified God. He already told them, this, something's going to happen that's going to, I'm going to be glorified in. And then he says, okay, now we're about to do that. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We can't. This, this, this stuff is going on. And then he's trying to encourage him, like, no, 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 it's okay. We're going to do this together, right? God will never ask you to go through something dangerous without him walking with you, right? 
Jesus, like, we're going to do, we're going to walk together and it's going to be okay. Verse 11, these things said he, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Again, second time they're not going to get it. Then disciples, Lord, oh, if he sleeps, he should be fine. He's sleeping, right? However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking a rest and sleep. Then said Jesus to them plainly, he's like, all right, <laughs> let me make it simple here. Lazarus is dead, and I am going for your sakes that I was not there to, intent, to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then said Thomas, third time, not fully getting it. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. But there's what's interesting here, he's still, he's, you can tell like he's saying like, he's, there's something he got from Jesus. It's just not fully understood. Like there's still something they're getting, like almost like you see a glimpse of them un understanding something he's taught, but not fully understanding what he fully meant. And then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave for four days already. Now Bethany was near to Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. I almost see there's, we would get a glimpse of also probably the temperaments of the two different women. There is something about Martha about get up and going, which I think is actually something to, that's beautiful in that one, okay, Jesus is here. I want to get to him. I want to, to get to him as quickly as I can. But Mary is maybe, you know, speculation. I can't, you know, say for sure, but there might have been a little bit more subdued, more maybe some depression there. Maybe she's even sadder, like she doesn't want to move, right? But we here see Martha, she's a get up and go type of woman. She wants to go to Jesus. And then verse 21, Martha to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. So there's their faith. They had faith. And Jesus, knowing, I know for sure, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. I know for sure. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. I'm curious if there's something in Martha that knew that maybe he can still do something like as grand as he did. I'm curious. Because we don't know exactly what she meant by that. Obviously, there's more of her faith there of knowing, okay, Jesus, I just trust you. I know this does not look good, but I'm just going to trust you that whatever you ask God of your father to do, you're going to do it, and it's going to be okay. And Jesus says to her, your brother shall rise again. Martha says to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So again, that glimpse, there's sometimes, we sometimes only have a partial understanding of what Jesus is saying. But what's to me a beautiful here is that, again, what's the first time we meet Martha? She's worried, she's preoccupied. Again, but her willingness to bring Jesus in, I think she did make the right choice just to sit and listen because there is an understanding there that she would not have gotten if she did not choose to sit at his feet and listen. So I, I think that's a picture of like, okay, Mary, Mary, Martha chose the right thing. She got that and allowed Jesus to speak into her. But Jesus said to her, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believe you this? She says to him, yea, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calls for you. Which is interesting here because nowhere do we see Jesus saying, Hey, go tell your sister, come here. 
So it's interesting to me, like almost I want Martha, this is a sisterly thing of like Martha knew what Mary needed. So it's like, hey, Jesus is calling. And but Mary responds to that. So that's a beautiful thing. We see this sister um, relationship where she what she knew what she, her sister needed. And she knew how to get there. Now, I don't, I don't know if it was a lie. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, did Jesus directly say it? No, but maybe she felt that. Like, Jesus, Jesus, need, like, Jesus wants to see you. She knew her, her sister needed that at the moment. Because you see right, right away the response, verse 29, as soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. So that instant feeling of like, oh, Jesus called me? Jesus, so right away she responds, Verse 30, now Jesus was not yet come into the town and was in the place where Martha met him. So I find it interesting that Jesus stayed. Almost like I wonder like if he knew. And also for her to, to act out this act of faith to go toward him. For her to have to go out to him as well. But it's like he did it. So she, Martha was able to go all the way back to where Mary was, but Jesus didn't move. Mary had to come to him. In verse 31, the Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, she goes to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. Again, she had that faith of knowing. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in spirit and was concerned, was troubled. And said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. That is one of the most profound things within this story, besides obviously Lazarus rising, but to see this glimpse of something we're told even in the Old Testament that he is acquainted with our grief. He's a man of sorrows. And that it was when he saw Mary grieving and all those people grieving that he wept as well. What a Jesus that still wants to meet us exactly where we are, no matter what we're going through, to meet us in that moment, to, to say that I understand that I weep as well with you to see that because he he knew Lazarus was going to rise. He wasn't weeping for Lazarus. He's weeping for them, seeing, responding to their grief. And to say that he's fully acquainted with that. He balls up our tears. It's such an amazing picture of our Jesus that fully understands our condition, no matter what we're going through. He fully understands it. Such a beautiful picture. Then he said, he then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. They, they, they even saw that more of that glimpse. What are the, these people that they came there to mourn with Mary and Martha, right? But they actually, in a way, because of them being maybe good friends or whatever, actually positioned themselves to believe. Actually positioned themselves to see a man that truly loved, to see a man that could do anything, to see God. So their, their choosing to be with them positioned themselves to be front row seats for that. Verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that? Even this man should not have died. Jesus, therefore, again, groaning in himself comes to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. I want to, Adam shared something with me. It was interesting. I don't know, think he knew I was talking about this, unless he did. I don't know. He, it was on Instagram. And it was this um, preacher that was talking about this exact passage of that. It was his groaning, not his grumbling. that Jesus was groaning for them in that moment. It was not grumbling, it was groaning, that, that holy grieving, that it's okay, 
to grieve, but not grumble. There is a groaning that can happen, a grieving that can happen, but not a grumbling. But verse 39, Jesus said, take you away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, says to him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead four days. Which is, again, it's a, it's a, it's a response that is interesting. Again, if you just look at all these little nuances, because here before she's talking about this faith of Jesus can do anything. Jesus, I believe, whatever you ask your father. But again, when Jesus is about to do it, there's a, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, what are you doing? Right? We saw what I mentioned, the same thing with the disciples. So it's almost sometimes like, okay, Jesus like, okay, I'm about to do what you asked for. You're like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> I don't know if I wanted, I didn't expect that way. I was like, are you sure about that? But here she had complete faith. But then, like, there's other side are like, oh, but it's going to stink. Like, are you sure you want to do that? Not looking beyond, like, Jesus is asking for that thing to open, and you don't know what's going to come out. It's like that. It's just, again, that interesting response to me. But, again, how can, it's amazing. Again, we can be exactly the same. Full of faith. Yes, Jesus, do this. And when Jesus is about to do it, or, like, or maybe Jesus doesn't do it in our timing, and then we get, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's almost sometimes, and it can... Sometimes, even on the worship stage, we're singing these songs of great faith, and then the next minute, we're doing something completely opposite of that. How exactly we can be the same way. But again, thank God we have a patient Jesus and a God that keeps on calling us to the more that he has for us and helping us recognize, putting that mirror in front of us. You're like, oh, oh, you're right. And what can I do? Again, God, help me see and God, Jesus is so strategic throughout this whole story. He's even from the beginning, he tells us in advance, like, look, everything that's about to happen is all for my glory. Is for him to wait to, until he's dead. Even, and he didn't wait right after he's dead. That was four days. Talk about Mary and Martha. Like, all of us have been in seasons of waiting, and what they would have gone through in those four days, knowing they actually maybe even longer, all we know is that they contacted him while he was still sick. So we don't know if he died right after that contact, a while after that contact. But again, they reach out to Jesus and they're in this period of waiting. What is Jesus going to do? And Jesus, when Jesus finally responds, they're still not ready for it. But what they must have gone through in that period of waiting, and that's another thing, because I was, to be honest with you, this whole week I was all over the place of wondering, like, God, what do you want me to say? And even at one point I felt like that word, like, waiting, like being in the waiting, because I know all of us have gone through seasons of that. But then I was just, I really wanted to go back to the story, because I felt it a while ago. And here is that, actually that message again kind of coming up. I'm like, oh, wow, there they, here are they in their waiting period, how they must have been grieving during that time being prayerful during that time, having faith. Like, you can have all that stuff all together. You know, you can have all that stuff all together, and that's okay. You know, and just to have, like, in the waiting time, like, God actually can strengthen us in that time. And not only did he make them wait for maybe for their own strengthening or just to, but also f to reveal something. Like, maybe God's waiting something in your life to also would bring him more glory. I almost like I'd rather wait for God's perfect timing so he gets more of the glory. Maybe more people need to witness it. Like maybe there's a certain timing for your breakthrough because maybe someone needs to be in your life to see that breakthrough. Maybe other people need to be there. Maybe those people that were there grieving wouldn't have been there if Lazarus was just sick. He waited. He knew those people were going to be there grieving with them. Like, oh, so those people, because we'll see later, most of them believed. Not all, but most. There's going to be people in your life that you think need to see your testimony, need to see your miracle, and they still don't get it. But that's okay. It's a seed that's planted in their life. But God was so strategic. Jesus was so strategic to wait, to do exactly at his timing. So verse 40, Jesus says to her, Said I not to you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God? Again, he's addressing that again. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, 
I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you hear me always, but because of the people which I stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. So there's his strategy, right? And when he has thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus says to them, loose him and let him go. Do we realize, like, he couldn't really walk? That, how did he come out of that grave? What did they just say? Hands bound and feet bound and something on his face. And here he comes just out of the grave, and he has to wait for people to, to let him loose. Wait a minute. Sometimes we just think of him just freely walking out, but look at what it just said. His feet were bound. How in the world did he come out? That's a miracle, even beyond him being dead. How did he walk out? Like Jesus is just like sometimes those little details, I feel like we skip by because then we see movies of it being like, well, because reasonably, how else is the guy going to come out? But no, it said his feet were bound. Just thinks that God's like, what? I always love those extra little details. Sometimes when we think of our, what God has done for us, and those extra little details sometimes he'll take out and be like, oh, did you notice that too? And you're like, whoa, God, I didn't. And sometimes it can be in seasons of grieving. I've, when on our first loss of a miscarriage, it's almost like after the fact, I didn't mind telling the story because I saw God completely in that day of the complete loss. And I was like, then I saw, every time I looked at the story again, I saw extra details. Like, wow, that day, I, was, I, was, I was, went to work in the morning, and I started feeling these pains. We had a half day because it was too hot. It wasn't supposed to be a half day, but that half day got me home to do what I needed at home, and then for my husband to take me to the hospital and all that. But I feel like little details of like, wow, God, you were with me in every step, even to make it too hot outside so I can be home early. Like, God, even in my, in my hardest moment, in my, one of my hardest days, you were completely there with me every step. Even to the fact I was able to lose the baby naturally and not do DNC, like God knew the whole timing of it all. Even in my, one of my darkest days, God was like, I was there. I was with you. Every step, just those little details. Again, even in this story, he was bound, and yet here he comes out of the grave, floating, hopping, we don't know. <laughs> but God did it. God did it. I lost my place. Oh, I'm still in 12 here. 45, then many of the Jews which came to Mary had seen the things which Jesus did and believed in him. That he didn't do it just for them. He did he, for Mary and Martha and Lazarus, but he did it for all those other people. He did it for them too. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And you had to think those people that didn't believe, guess what? They were actually on assignment as well and also doing this whole process of what Jesus had to walk through. But that whole scenario, that whole scene is so strategic. Because then we go on in the rest of this chapter, you know, it, it talks about the, you know, the Pharisees and then they have to, to plan. But I want to skip over to 12 now because this is now the third time. And it's almost like Jesus' farewell tour, right? He knows he's about to, to go th through death and resurrection. And it's fascinating the houses that, because it's in John 12, you know, we see him at Mary Martha's house. But in also two other books, we see him at Simon the, the leper's house. So it's almost like he made personal visits to people, even on his way to dying for them and rising for them. But we're going to go into the third story here when Mary anoints Jesus in chapter 12. 
than Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus was with, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. See, there's Martha serving again. Remember, serving was never the issue. Serving is never the issue. It's our heart, the condition of our heart. That was the issue, not serving. We're called to serve. Jesus needs us to serve, right? Jesus needed Martha at that time to, to make food for him and his disciples. What an undertaking. Even the first time, something to mention, when Martha invited Jesus, it wasn't just Jesus, it was his whole entourage. So what an undertaking to, to do, to choose to do, to invite this man as, along with 12 other men and maybe other people into your home. That was an undertaking. That also tells us that maybe she was a little well-to-do. She was also well-known. I think people knew of this family. Um, Lazarus, so Martha served. Lazarus was at the table with him. And then here comes Mary. Then took Mary a pound of ointment, a spikenard of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. So there, remember, there was Mary first, sitting at the feet of Jesus. She positioned herself for this moment. If she wasn't there at his feet first, we might not have had this moment. But within that time of her being at Jesus' feet, she got a revelation that almost no one got at that time. Even his disciples didn't even fully get here was she putting this oil on his feet, anointing him, even, not even caring about her dignity either, of using her hair to wipe his feet because she got a revelation that what, what he was about to do. She got an understanding. She caught that where no one else did. And that, to me, that's just so amazing that here we got a picture of this woman that she saw, she understood, she received it. This, this revelation of what, again, Jesus is about to die on the cross and preparing him for that. And here's verse 4, Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Here is her, her action of worship getting ridiculed again. Of what, her choice to position herself exactly where she needs to be getting ridiculed again. But as Mary, obviously it seems Mary does not care because she has found that one thing. She has found that the man... Jesus, she has fully understood, but here is again not being understood, her, herself not being understood. In verse 6, this said he, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bore what was put therein. That means he took, sometimes he took whatever he wanted. And he was so fascinating to me, too. It's like Jesus knew who Judas was, yet still put him as treasure. That little part just, like, wow. Wow, Jesus. And then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me have not always. Many people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also. So here's that story that's still getting people. So it's amazing. Again, his testimony is still drawing people to Jesus. May ours also do the same thing. And not to be, you know, to hinder us speaking what God has done for us. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus to death also. Because that, by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. And then it goes into, in, in John, and then it goes right into him on Palm Sunday, right, him being received. What's interesting in that story, that in two other spots um, in the New Testament, we do have another story 
of a woman, not this, remember Mary, in this story, Mary anoints his feet. In the other story, they're still in Bethany. He's at Simon the leper's house. And here's a woman anointing his head with oil. Now, some scholars believe it's the same woman. I can't speak that authoritatively. I don't know. The Bible doesn't clearly say it was Mary, or those two other writers didn't say. But it's fascinating to still note both stories, because what Mary anointed the feet, and the other woman anointed his head, which is important to understand, because to anoint the head is meant for that's a kingly position, to be anointed on the head. So here is right before death, he is anointed on the head with oil as a king, and anointed by the feet as a servant. To, to still recognize both of those capacities of Jesus as a king and from his head to his feet, from the high to the low. He was there for all, and he would, was there as all, that he was a servant to all of us. Also, it was um, a custom as well to wash the feet. So here is Mary being the host, part of the host party, doing her due diligence, but obviously staking a step further because of knowing what Jesus was about to walk through. But it's, again, and both stories as well with the woman on the head, it doesn't say exactly Judas. It says the disciples ridiculed her and said the same fact, exact thing, saying, well, this could have been sold three, for 300 denarii and given to the poor. But again, that's that thing of you can't be so focused on serving other people and not serving Jesus. It's almost like they got that glimpse, like, yes, we're supposed to help the poor. But when it's all about helping the poor and not doing our due diligence and being a, a priest for serving in the house to serving Jesus, then all it is, we're just, it's a humanitarian work. It's, that's all it is. So if we take Jesus out of the picture, it's not what we've been called to do. Yes, it's important to care for the poor, but it's also important for us to make sure that we are at Jesus' feet, that we are serving him and loving him. And also in this story of that, she gave everything, absolutely everything. That could have meant the rest of her life because obviously she's, there's no husband to be said. We don't know how old she is, but this can be all that she had. But she was willing to risk it all. Why? Because she first chose to sit at his feet and catch a glimpse to receive that revelation of what Jesus has for her. For us to be willing also to God, like, what, what do I have that you are asking me to fully pour out on all over you? To serve you. What are you asking of me? And it, the, if we don't know, well, guess what? The more you spend time with him, the more you'll figure that out. Because I'm sure Mary didn't know this the first time she sat at his feet. But probably the continual of him, of her being with Jesus, she, she got it. So revelation comes from a place of intimacy. She got that, that revelation spending time with him. Serving should be from a place of rest and intimacy, of knowing Jesus. And also throughout the, this whole, she also recognized that Jesus was the most important person in the room. Not anyone else, not, the, not Judas who was complaining, that her role right there was to focus on Jesus and do exactly what she was called to do, to anoint him for the next step. And even to this point, remember, the disciples were still thinking he's going to conquer Right? So again, like it's interesting, we can receive, you know, the revel sometimes we can receive truth, but we have to be careful of what grid system we're receiving it in. Because they're, they still had this filter of the conquering, you know, of conquering Rome and this, this whole maybe force or whatever. They were still receiving what he was saying through that filter. But here Mary was not. Mary didn't receive that filter. So we have to be careful of what we receive. The filter sometimes will we'll put truth through and to make sure it's a Jesus filter, 
not our own um, agenda, not our own thing, but what Jesus is trying to say. Because it is fascinating how many of the disciples didn't get until after he, he rose and they were like, oh, that's not what he came to do. My whole agenda is not what he came to do. He had such a bigger agenda. How like, you know, I think John was the first really one to really get it. The fact that he was at the cross. But the other ones obviously got it as well. But to be careful of what filter were, even because it's a shame. To me, it's so sad of how many times this book has been used for evil. That just shows a people that didn't get it that also was receiving what this book was saying through a filter of the enemy. And we have to be careful, even in this day and age, we can easily, people are still, <laughs> to this day, using this book for evil. But that's just the enemy twisting, right? We have to, even, there's so many times, we have to be careful in our own life to make sure Jesus is taking the place he rightly deserves. Because that's what the enemy constantly wants to do is to knock Jesus down into a, a, a little Jesus, a Jesus that can't do that. Or even, I even think of just in our holidays of how we celebrate, of how many times something that's supposed to be about Jesus, like Christmas and Easter, and how we want to sprinkle all this other stuff in that. It, part of it's like, oh yeah, it's cute for the kids, but honestly, some of it is because of just the enemy trying to knock Jesus down from what those days are really supposed to be about. That's why for my family, we might do some, some things that maybe not everybody does. Is because we want to make sure Jesus is at the forefront. I don't care about Santa Claus. I don't. He doesn't buy those gifts. <laughs> but it's, just, it's to make sure that we're being careful within our lives, within our family. Are we making sure we're putting Jesus where he belongs, where he deserves, in everything that we do, that he has to be first? And what does that look like? And here is Mary is a picture of a woman who chose that, to put him first, no matter what, despite maybe everyone thinking she's losing everything, that she's giving away everything, but actually she did exactly what she needed to do. So just the last couple of things to wrap it up here. But remember, allow Jesus to check your soul going back to the beginning there. Invite him in. No matter what condition you're in, give him room. And give him room to also to check you, to, to, to reveal what else might be going inside. Your po posture and position is important. Where you position yourself to every opportunity when you need to be at his feet, be at his feet. To make sure that to receive what God has for you. You're going to get more revelation into what he has for you the more you position yourself at his feet. Do not despise the assignment of others. Right? If you're in a certain different season and people are not in that season, maybe, maybe you can look at someone that maybe is doing something you wish you can do, then work toward that. Maybe is Martha almost like being jealous of Mary, like, oh, she can be in this place of just carefree and being by Jesus' feet. But rather than ridicule her going to Jesus and be like, don't you care? Because also it's interesting, that's an accusation. She had an accusation toward Jesus. You don't care, Jesus. Like, but actually he fully did. He fully cared about her soul. So rather than accusing him, or it's also it's interesting to me like when people pray as a rebuke to other people. Have you ever done that <laughs> or heard that? It's, just, it's almost like it felt like that, too. It was like we're praying, like, Jesus, help brother so-and-so. They're not doing good. And brother so-and-so is, like, right there. <laughs> Rather than actually speaking to the person. So it's, it's want to make sure that, again, like, if we see someone, like, that maybe is further along, and, like, it's only, like, God, do you care? How come I don't? I'm not there yet. It's like, well, because there's some stuff inside you haven't let me deal with yet. Let me deal with that, and then you'll get to where, because also, where they are, that's where they are. That's where I need them to be. When I work through that stuff in here, oh, I, I have a, something else for you. That's going to be exactly for you. 
but allowing God again to do the work on the inside so you can be exactly where you need to be, to allow him to do that. And to remember the time, Jesus is the most important person in the room. And it doesn't, it's not only Sunday mornings during worship. Even at your job, he's at your job. He's at your house. He's everywhere, right? But it's not, it's because it's this tension of we invite him in, but also the omnipresence of God. But it's also when we take that action of, of welcoming in, it's almost like we just become more aware of his presence. That's all it is. It's just being us aware that he's there, being aware of his presence. Because you can be in a room, right? I can be in this room right now and let's say totally ignore Mary the whole time. I don't see Mary. But she's there. It doesn't matter. Oh, oh, there she is. Now I can look at her beautiful smile <laughs> and interact with her, you know? And it's, so it's us, for us to be aware of like we complete, completely blinded to like Jesus is right there. But I need to be like, oh. There's Jesus. I need to look at him for a while. I need that. I need that, what he has for me. And especially in times of worship, because I know we can get distracted. I mean, I got distracted toward the end. All of a sudden, the kids were picking her over something. But, and just being aware, sometimes the enemy will just do little things through the people you most love <laughs> to try to get you off track. But... Um, but God is so good. God is so good. So I'm so grateful of just the patience of Jesus that he has toward us as well. And I have no doubt that each one of you here know that God will speak to you if you sit and listen and let him in to allow him to work through anything that's in here. Because I think I've said so many times when I come up here, it's just like when I see more and more people just get right it just makes this community so much stronger and it's really about each everyone coming together and doing their part and it, which can be so unstoppable to see a church fully together in, in unity and just being able to change a change a community change the area around us so i have no doubt god is in the work of that and i just you know love and bless you all let's pray and it's 1202 so, so, Lord, we just thank you that you're so patient with us. You're so patient, God, but we do put before you anything that you need to work on with us. Anything that maybe has been hindering us from sitting at your feet. From maybe us responding out of worry rather than faith. Help us to choose you, Jesus to choose you, to position ourselves exactly where we need to be and not to care what other people are saying, to fully be focused on you and to be willing to see what you're doing through us for your glory, Jesus, that you have done so many things for all of us here, for us to put that, our testimony, be a testimony of your goodness and your faithfulness. God, we give you this week that we would continue to walk with you, desire you, and thank you for this community, God, that we know that we have each other, that if anyone's struggling, that we can go to somebody, that we would be your hands and feet, God. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.